जय राधाम माधवा कुंज विहारी Giri Bara Dhanadhi Jaya Gopi Janavallabha Giri Bara Dhanadhi Giri Bara Saurnandan Brajadhar Hanjanayas Saurnandan Brajadhar Hanjanayas Jamuna Thira Hagana Bhupa, 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 
प्रभुपाध प्रभुपाध थाय घोर हरि भरि 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 भोरंग थाय घोर हरि भरि भरि भोर हरि भ मनंदे हरि 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 बोल श्री प्रभु पाद की जय हरि नाम संकीर्तन की जय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय दुर्वासमुनि वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इम्पोर्टेंट एंड वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग पास टाइम्स इन दायर भागवताम विच विल कम अप लेटर इन द चैप्टर But right now we'll begin with something different. <laughs> hmm. Sri Sukha Uvacha. Na bago na baga patyam. Yam tatham bartara kavim. Yavastham vyabajandayam. ब्रह्मचारिण आगत श्रीसुक उवाच नाभगो नाभगाम तथम भ्रातरा कवि ये यास्थम व्याभंदा ब्रह्मचारिण आगत श्रीसुक उवाच नाभगो नाभगा पात्यम या भ्रातर कवि यास्थम व्याभंदा ब्रह्मचारिण आगत Ramachari Namah. 
Sri Sukha Uvacha. Sri Sukha Deva Goswami said, Nabhaga, Nabhaga, Nabhava Apatyam was the son of Maharaj Nabhaga. Yam, unto whom? Tatam, the father. Bratara, the elder brothers. Kavim, the learned. Yavistam, the youngest. Yavajan, divided. Dayam, the property. Brahmacharinam, having accepted the life of a brahmachari perpetually. Naistika, agatim, returned. Hmm. Anaistika refers to the previous one. So, agatam returned, okay. Translation, hmm. so we're beginning the chapter. So we're setting the stage for the main part. And he's usually the descendants of those who are about to be spoken about. Sri Sukadeva Goswami said, the son of Nabhaga, named Nabhaga, lived for a long time at the place of his spiritual master. Therefore, his brother thought, brothers thought that he was not going to become a grihasta and would not return. Consequently, without providing a share for him, they divided the property of their father among themselves. When Nabhaga returned from the place of his spiritual master, they gave him their father as the share. We'll read later that the father says, no. <laughs> That's the next. Father doesn't agree to become the share. But he has an alternative plan, so it works out. Purport. There are two kinds of brahmacharis. One may return home, marry, and become a householder, whereas the other, known as Brihad Vrata, takes a vow to remain a brahmachari perpetually. The Brihad Vrata brahmachari does not return from the place of the spiritual master. He stays there and later he directly takes sannyas. Because Nabhaga did not return from the place of his spiritual master, his brothers thought that he had taken Brihadvrata Brahmacharya. Therefore, they did not preserve his share, and when he returned, they gave him their father as his share. Omagyan timirandasya ginajana salakaya chaksun militam yena tas my shri guruvena maha nama om vishnu madaya krishna pastaya bhutale shri makti bhakti vedanta swami tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauramani Vajarine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa Taru Vistya Kripa Sindhu Bhe Vacha Patita Nam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we have a little dilemma here. There was an assumption by the some of the brothers of <coughs> King Nabaga that that he uh, was the, their other brother, also called Nabaga, didn't come back. So it was time to divide their father's property among themselves. They didn't give him any because they thought, well, he's not going to return. He's going to be stay and become a lifelong brahmachari, only because he was away for a while. But actually, that wasn't the case. Although he stayed away for a while, he did return. And now the dilemma is, and the brothers made a mistake. 
when the father irons it out later, you'll find you'll, that they said, okay, well, there's no property left to be given to you, so you just take our father. <laughs> and uh, uh, when he went to his father and said, well, <laughs> Well, now you're my property, Father said, no way. <laughs> Your brothers can't do that. It's not according to, you know, proper behavior, proper etiquette, and it's just, I'm not your property. So, but then he gives him an alternative. He says there is a sacrifice being performed. And these uh, persons, after they finish the sacrifice, the leaf of the heavenly planets and all the all the gold and jewels that were part of the sacrifice, they will give it to you. So you go there and you collect after the sacrifice. So that that's kind of like what happens. But here we're hearing about you know brahmachari, two kinds of brahmacharis. Ones who uh, you know practice brahmachari for some time and then decide after that. It will be more suited for me to practice Krishna consciousness in, in household life, in grihastha life. And so they train because in order to become a good grihastha, you have to have good brahmachari training. You can't just jump into becoming a grihastha and expect that you're going to be able to uh, be successful in that. If you have good brahmachari training ahead of time, you study the scriptures, you know the scriptures, you, you develop a sense of obedience to the spiritual master in that mood of brahmachari. Then when it's time to move on to the, to, to the next ashram, then um, you are educated and you also can enter into that ashram without any, what we say, confusion because Krishna consciousness is work, works in such a way as that we need training. It's all about training. Prabhupada said, if we don't give devotees training, then how will they practice Krishna consciousness? So it's not just simply learning the scriptures. That is, that is part of the training. The training is proper behavior, proper etiquette, proper knowledge, and proper understanding of relationships. So a brahmachari is very much dedicated to the spiritual master when he enters into the brahmachari ashram. And in the absence of the spiritual master, the temple authorities, or sometimes they call it the brahmachari leader, becomes the person that they work under. And then that gives them the proper, in other words, they engage in menial service. They learn to uh, accept whatever is given to them as their service and they work accordingly. They make friends with other brahmacharis and develop a, a, a rapport with the other brahmacharis and therefore the ashram actually flourishes due to that kind of development. Um, because we all need friendship, we all need social interaction. We are social beings. <laughs> if we try to remain distinct from that mood and we find that we look for, uh, we look for that in a materialistic way. We have to find it in, in, within the confounds of authorized association through associating with other brahmacharis and developing friendly and we even say intimate relationships where you actually develop really strong friendship. And that takes time to develop, but once it develops, then you're fixed. And then if you decide after some time, well, I think I could perform devotional service better in the Grihastha ashram. And that's the principle for change. The principle of change is not simply, well, this looks better and that looks, this is not so good. No, it's how best can I serve? <laughs> that's the principle for change. So can I serve better as a Grihastha or more effectively as a Grihastha, more efficiently as a Grihastha, more readily as a grihastha, and then that would be a, the uh, what we say reason or the mo the motivation for moving to the ashram. It's all about service. How best you can serve. That's the 
That's more or less the understanding for the, for the making the decision. I can serve better here with the support of a wife and with the, within that confounds. Therefore, I can, uh, therefore I should move into that ashram. And if one thinks, well, no, I can serve better here and maybe I don't want to take out any other added responsibilities then, and one will remain brahmachari. But here, if one remains brahmachari, then it says they continue to work under the guidance of the spiritual master and the temple authority. There's no such thing as an independent brahmachari. That's an oxymoron. Oxymoron means two things that don't go together. Just like we say, uh, honest businessman. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> Or we might even say, what else is a, an oxymoron? A small crowd. A crowd is a crowd, and a small crowd is what? <laughs> so people sometimes say that. There was a small crowd. <laughs> but that's an oxymoron. In other words, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so uh, independent brahmachari Prabhupada shot that down many times. He called it bachelor daddy. Living outside and thinking that you can remain brahmachari, independent and for any kind of supervision. And that is an illusion. And generally, that's uh, probably, probably call it bachelor daddy. What does bachelor daddy mean? Well, they're a bachelor, but they're a daddy at the same time. <laughs> so that's another oxymoron. <laughs> We we'll probably use that example to say, yeah, brahmachari means ashram. It means ashram. Ashram means under the guidance of the spiritual master or his representatives and working in that way. And if you uh, dedicate yourself to that in a very serious way, you'll see the benefits of brahmachari. If you don't, then you will miss the benefits of brahmachari because brahmachari is a very... One brahmachari is as good as is a sannyasi. There's no difference. The only difference is one stays within the confounds of the temple and works there, and the other one goes out and preaches and travels. So brahmacharis and sannyasis are practically the same in quality, because both actually are meant to preach, to preach and to know the scriptures and to engage in various, in various kinds of devotional service. Of course, the preacher generally focuses on that, and the brahmachari will accept whatever service is given. So, therefore, ashram has to be defined very carefully, because uh, <clears throat> just to wear a particular color doesn't make you a member of that ashram. It's the consciousness behind it. Yeah, and that's why in some places, before we actually award saffron to certain persons who are in the brahmachari ashram, they may come and wear uh, white, then uh, they have to come up to a certain standard of uh, surrender. That's what it's really about, surrender and knowledge. In some temples, every brahmachari is required to give class. And brahmachari, one of the, the word brahmachari means student. <laughs> and student means what? One who studies. What are you studying? The philosophy, probably has books. And therefore, study means also to understand, and understand means to apply, and apply means to speak. So in that way, one should also be able to give a class at any time. That is a brahmachari. If he's asked, okay, give a class, he's happy, he's ready, he can sit there, he knows the philosophy. Because <clears throat> otherwise, if we don't study this philosophy in brahmachari life, and we decide later to get married, we might find ourselves in a very uh, awkward position, not knowing how to act or interact, not based on a lack of knowledge, both in etiquette and both in philosophical teachings. So yeah, brahmachari means really one who really knows the scriptures and can quote the scriptures, can recite the scriptures, is ready to speak at any time, at any place, like that. So 
Just like in the year 1996 in ISKCON, there was a survey taken by the GBC, and that was the same, that was the 100th anniversary of Srila Prabhupada's appearance. One, 100 years later, Prabhupada was born in 1896. That was called the centennial year. And a lot of activities went on in that year, centered around Srila Prabhupada and about recharging the ISKCON society, seeing where we need to work on. And one of the surveys that they did, just to see why do devotees leave Krishna consciousness? Why do devotees leave Krishna consciousness? And there was three reasons given. And the survey took months and months and months, and so it was done very extensively and very carefully. Why, why after some time a devotee will leave? Well, one of them is not, the first, number one reason was not having loving and very friendly relationships with other devotees. And that was one of the reasons. Of course, sometimes when that doesn't happen, if you're in a brahmachari, you think, well, I need to fill that need by getting married, because that need is there. We are... We have to have relationships with others. It's just, it's just the nature of the living entity to interact in a very friendly and loving way with others. It's just natural. It's just our nature. It's human nature. Those who don't do that are not happy. And so the survey showed that that was the number one reason why devotees in ISKCON were leaving not developing those loving relationships or friendly relationships with other devotees, whether the women amongst the women, the men amongst the men, like that. And what was the second reason? The second reason was that grihastas could not find how to execute devotional service and at the same time maintain their griha. So, of course, this was mostly in the United States, but also around the world also. How to somehow or other provide the economic needs for my ashram and at the same time continue in my devotional service. So they opted for the economic side. And then many of them left and got jobs and that wound up just coming to the temple like once a week or on holiday or on festival days like that and started to drift away because the economic pressure was there. Not that every grihasta has to leave the, in the confines of the temple life. That could be facilitated, but most of it felt that most of them felt that that's what they needed. And that's generally what happens after a due course of time. The wife always wants to her little what we say, bhajan kutir, <laughs> it's just natural. The women want their house and, or some apartment or some place calling. It's just the way it is. And the third reason was that uh, brahmacharis were used as fundraisers, not preachers. In order to collect money, in order to support the temple, various types of programs for fundraising was instituted and brahmacharis were given service in that way because they were usually going out and meeting people through book distribution. Now a lot of that energy was diverted to getting money because the temples needed money. And so many of those brahmacharis now who are taught to develop a type of detachment were in a service that was very much fostering attachment. <laughs> we need money. <laughs> and so, and of course, because that consciousness wasn't really developed to the point of detachment, then many of them just left <laughs> and just thought, and I either got married or just left the ashram. <laughs> 
So after analyzing these three, what we say, reasons why people or devotees were leaving the, uh, and then there was some, some effort to swing away from that, and then the devotee care system started to, how to care for devotees, especially for brahmacharis, and then there was a, there was a whole. Uh, I don't know what they call it, you know, group or system uh, entity that was formed within the United, within ISKCON to take care of devotees and make sure they get all their needs. And that was actually now, of course, it's developed into the whole devotee care system, which is helping a lot. And it's kind of overcoming some of these anomalies that were there and, in the beginning, Jai Sisi Panchatat of Ki Jai. So, yeah, brahmachari life is here. Of course, it mentions here two kinds of brahmachari. One of the most important things is austerity. Brahmacharis have to accept austerity. Uh, austerity makes a person strong. A person, we can become strong by chanting the holy name spiritually, and of course that is considered the austerity of this age, to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. But then there are other austerities that we must also follow very much, and that, that is keeping our life very simple, not accumulating too many things. Grihastas are given some leadway in that area because they have to maintain griha, or griha means home, place. But brahmacharis have to live very simple, just have what you need, and that life becomes easy. That's why brahmachari life means, another word for brahmachari is light. Not light in illumination, but light in weight. Simple. The more simple you live, the easier it is to practice brahmachari. Of course, we can't go beyond a certain point because you have to fulfill certain needs like that. But the brahmachari should be completely dedicated to following the instructions of the spiritual master as given by the authorities in the temple. And the temple has to be completely Focus on seeing what the brahmacharis need in order to help them to continue in their spiritual life, whether it's the facility they need in order to um, do their service, whether it's if sometimes if they have to go to India for a pilgrimage, the temple should provide the money for that. In other words, the brahmacharis don't have any independent and the temple becomes like the father, <laughs> temple leader like that. And that's, uh, I lived like that for many years. We had a brahmachari ashram in New Vrindavan. And that's where I started. And it was away from the rest of the, uh, um, what do you say, devotees. We had three uh, temples within the New Vrindavan. It's a rural area. And the brahmachari ashram was two miles in the woods up the mountains, over the hills, over the streams, and in a very secluded place. That's where we were. And I didn't, and one time, you know, Radhana Swami was also there, and we were, he was there, and one time he, he was giving a lecture. This was after he left the Brahmachari Ashram and was preaching. He said, when I was in a Brahmachari, in, in two years I saw four women. And so and he meant to name the four women, Radharani, Subhadra, Tulsi, and Kao. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I was up there also for about two and two and a half months, and then one lady came up and I said, what, what species is that? Oh, yeah, I forgot, there was another, there's another gender somewhere uh, on this planet, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we didn't have any association with the, the opposite sex, and it was just the brahmacharis by ourselves. And we maintained the ashram, 
And we took care of the deities. We had our own deities there, separate from the main deities in the main farm. And um, sometimes we would go and do other work on the other farms just to... Uh, but um, I was the uh, cook and Ranaswami was the pujari. We had one woodcutter because everything we did was by wood. And uh, we would, uh, everyone would be up, get up by about 2.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. We go to bed at 9, get up around 2.30. If you get up at 3, that was okay. If you get up at 3.30, you were in Maya. <laughs> if you, anything later than that, you, you were about to change ashrams. That was obvious. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, had, we had nothing <laughs> like that. Um, we had a pair of rubber boots <laughs> to help us get through the mud because New Vrindavan was full of mud. And if you wanted a new pair, because usually you wore them out after maybe a couple of months or so, you put in a requisition for some new boots and it usually took about a month to get it. <laughs> in the meantime, we had to wear boots with holes in them and devotees would take plastic bags that, w that the flowers came in, because we would buy flowers from the outside. And they'd come and plant, we'd take these bags and we'd wrap them around our, our socks and put them inside the boots so if our feet would be dry because <laughs> there was holes in the boots and water would get in there. So that was, you know, so this is the way we live. And there was no hot water. We didn't have any hot water. All the water was cold and it was coming from an underground stream. So in the winter time, it was like, like being cut with a, a knife. It was so cold. <laughs> We took some really fast baths, too. You know. <laughs> and there wasn't any showers. We had a big pickle barrel. And we took a bucket and dipped it into the water in this big pickle bucket. And then we'd throw it over ourselves like that, one or two buckets. When I first got there, we were bathing outside in the winter with cold water. And... Um, one lady who was living somewhere on the, on, the, on the grounds, she would hear screaming every day. <laughs> and then she, would, then she said, I was wondering, somehow like somebody's being killed, but then I realized it's the brahmacharis taking showers. <laughs> it was so cold. Sometimes we'd have to break the ice just to get to the water because the, the pond would be frozen over. Fortunately, that changed about two months after I got there, and I was so happy. <laughs> then we had an indoor bathhouse with still no cold wood, with only cold water, so it was like that. We had one dhoti, that's all. You weren't allowed to have more than one dhoti. You wear it all day, you wash it in the evening, and then hopefully it'll be dry in the morning. <laughs> So this was life as brahmachari. It was really, really austere. And um, lunch was, was, they called it dal, but it wasn't dal. <laughs> it, was, it was split pea. It was just like really heavy, these green split peas. And we had, with no spices in it, we had rice with no salt and no ghee, chapatis with no ghee, and that was lunch. <laughs> of course, that led to another problem that devotees were stealing the maha in order to make up for the difference, but, but that's another story. I'll tell you that later on because that's a little bit more exciting. But yeah, well, I just mentioned there was a, what happened was that the brahmacharis started breaking into the maha cabinet because we were giving nice, nice prasadam to the deities, a nice boga to the deities. And that would only be distributed in breakfast time. You couldn't get any maha during the day. In no time, it would be locked up. A lot of brahmacharis were breaking into the maha cabin. They would, you know, saw the padlock off or break the hinges or somehow get the doors open. And um, so, um, but then we th they, they came up with a penalty that anybody who gets caught stealing maha has to get married. So that was the penalty. <laughs> wow. 
So every week there was a marriage on Sunday, I remember. <laughs> yeah, it was not, every week we was, and the ladies were really excited about the whole program. <laughs> But the men were, I don't know, I guess that some of them, there was one devotee, he wanted to get married, so he kept getting caught stealing maha. And so they wound up giving him a girl that nobody would marry, so. <laughs> Just to punish him for stealing maha and trying to get caught. So, yeah, so, I mean, life was really, really simple and really, really austere. And we used to work. Mm -hmm really, really hard. I mean, I mean, we were working so hard because we were building Prabhupada's palace at the time. So most of the brahmacharis were engaged in construction. Fortunately, I was a pujari. I mean, I was a cook. Later on, I became a pujari, but I was a cook. And uh, I cooked on a wooden stove and uh, and all the wood would be brought in from the forest. We were not allowed to cut down any trees because Prabhupada said you shouldn't kill any trees. So the woodcutter would go out to the woods and look for broken pieces of wood that would be falling on the ground or dead trees, either one. And then we would use that for our cooking and for our heating, everything. We heated the place, we cooked everything. And in the winter time, when the wood was wet, they would give it to me and I would put it into the stove and it would just, the whole place was full of smoke. <laughs> and sometimes they would look in the kitchen, is Chandramali in there? I don't see anybody. <laughs> it's, yeah, they couldn't, they actually would have to really look hard to see if I was, I was there. But <laughs> so at one point my eyes got really bad because of the smoke and I couldn't see. <laughs> I lost my eyesight, most of it. So they called in an Ayurvedic doctor and uh, he knew the remedy for putting my eyes back in shape. And so he gave me some honey and warm water, half and half, mix it, put it on your eyes, close it and leave it there for a half hour, do it about three times a day. And I did and after one week my eyes were again back okay. So this was brahmachari life in New Vrindavan. It was really, really austere, like that. And uh, we, everyone got up early and everyone went to bed at nine o'clock. Prashadam was austere and we worked like that. But it was nice. There was no politics. The devotees worked together. I mean, we had our problems too. That was always there. But it was nice because everything centered around the deities. Our whole life was simply to make the deities, you know, uh, do whatever we could to serve the deities in the nicest way, the nicest prashadam, keeping everything, the nicest clothes. The clothes were bought in India and all the money went to the deities and none of the money went to the brahmacharis. <laughs> Zero. We didn't get anything. I didn't see money. I didn't see a phone. I didn't see a television. I remember when Radhana Swami, he was in the Brahmachari Ashram for many years and then he was sent out to preach. So he went preaching in one high school and he's there. This is 1978. This was after Prabhupada had left because right after Prabhupada left, then there was a, a move to start preaching outward morally. So he was in one little high school and he's speaking to the students and he says to the students, hmm, you know, soon you will graduate and then you'll be eligible to get drafted. Because in the, in the United States, the draft was on, at least. If you were at a certain age, they could draft you into the army and you would have to serve for three to four years. So he's, saying, he's speaking like that to the students. You know, when you, you, know, when you, get, uh, you get graduated, you get drafted, and then, you know, President Nixon will send you to Vietnam. <laughs> he was trying to, you know, shake them up a little bit. So at the end of the class, one student said, 
excuse me, sir, but, uh, you know, the Vietnam War has been over for five years, and President Nixon is no longer the president. <laughs> so you get the message. When we were living in the Brahmachari ashram, we didn't know, there was no other world. <laughs> Nothing. It was just, all we had was each other and the service and the deities. And life was really, really nice. It was simple. And um, we had our service and the kirtans were like the best. <laughs> we had some really good kirtans. Devotees would go crazy in the kirtan, but that's another thing. <laughs> so, of course, not everyone was able to maintain that lifestyle, and many devotees did move on. Some left and some actually, um, you know, went to the Grihasta ashram and became really fixed in devotional service. You want to hear a funny story? Well, and that's not a fun. The leader of the brahmachari, he was very tall, very good looking, very intelligent. And so he was leading us. I remember his name was Param Brahma. And there was one Mataji. She really wanted him for her husband. And she used to go to the deities and pray. And I would watch her, I could see. I knew who she was praying for. <laughs> so, and she was really praying. <laughs> and uh, so when he found out that actually she was interested in him, at that time there must have been something in his life that made him reconsider. So he was thinking, hmm, should I get married or should I remain brahmachari? So he was talking to different devotees and he was getting different opinions. So he really wasn't sure. So we had a lake just across the, across the way from the, the main ashram. It was a man-made lake. We made it. It was big. And in the middle of the lake, there was a raft. You know what a raft is. Okay. So he decided to make an experiment. And this is a very instructive story for the brahmacharis. <laughs> and he, this, this experiment was that he was going to fall asleep on the raft, go to sleep at his normal time, which was really about 9 o'clock at night, and lay in the middle of the raft on the water. And if he, if he, when he wakes up, if the raft is on the east side of the lake, he would stay brahmachari, and if the raft was on the west side of the lake, he would get married. Really interesting way to decide your ashram. <laughs> so, so everybody thought, well, you can't make a decision, you know, might as well try something. <laughs> so so he, he did it, and he laid on the raft, and then he went to sleep, and then he woke up at 1.30 in the morning on the east side. But then he thought, it's too early. <laughs> so he went, back to, <laughs> he went back to sleep. <laughs> so you know the, the ending of the story. <laughs> the wind decided to move the other way. <laughs> and now he woke up on the west side and swaha, swaha. So yeah. So the idea is don't sleep too much. <laughs> yeah, so brahmacharis, they say brahmacharis always should be a little tired. It's good for them. Yahastras can, you know, they can get full, full rest because they have a lot of response. But brahmacharis should be a little tired. And that way they don't see the material energy so clearly. <laughs> and don't get attracted to it. Anyway, that's another, that's a, a, a what we call a, a concocted philosophy. But it was like that. I remember, I, I never, I used to sleep four hours a night, four and a half hours a night. Some devotees, some brahmacharis would sleep three and a half, four hours like that, and work the entire day. Of course, sometimes when it came to class, everyone would fall asleep, but that was another thing. <laughs> Because everything, as soon as you'd sit down, 
there was two mantras. The mantra for going to sleep was Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And the mantra for waking up was Sadira Avidya Jatendriya Teka. So that's what it was like. But the point was that we had nothing, zero. I mean, hard, we didn't even have enough clothes. And, but we were happy. And I can actually say that devotees were happy. I mean, for some, it was really a struggle. But most of us were happy because we had our devotee, we had our service, we had each other, we had the deities, we had kirtans, and life was simple. We didn't look around for anything else like that. And, uh, and of course, Srila Prabhupada was writing letters regularly to the leader of the community, Kirtananda Swami. Build New Vrindavan to your heart's content. Make it a place of pilgrimage in the West. You know, and so we actually decided to develop it in such a way that we could attract more and more people to come to New Vrindavan. So it was a lot of emphasis on construction. Most of the brahmacharis were engaged in construction work like that. Fortunately, I wasn't suited, suited for that. I was in the kitchen cooking. They called me a cook, but I, they didn't like what I cooked anyway. <laughs> Sometimes the prashadam was burnt or something like that. So yeah, I wasn't such a good cook. And so you'll see, you don't see, the only thing I, the closest thing I do to the kitchen now is look into it. I don't get any farther. <laughs> Anyway, this was some, some principles of brahmachari life that but there was a lot of good things and the good things was that life was simple. We depended on each other for our association and for our support in Krishna consciousness. And now, of course, we didn't have any money and therefore it was like that. I mean, the temple didn't, didn't have any money at all. And if some new person came to the community, we'd ask them, you know, did you bring any money? <laughs> and then please donate it because we need money. So life was simple like that. So, And of course, some devotees decided to move on to the Grihastha ashram. And very few actually stayed brahmachari, only a few, not too many. Uh, but some of them got married many, many, many years later anyway. So it doesn't matter, Grihe Thakul, Bone Thakul, Sabda Hari Boli Thakul, whatever ashram you're in, just become Krishna conscious. That is the, that is the, that is the, it's not like one ashram is better than another. One ashram is better than another according to the individual. But in a general sense, all ashrams are places of spiritual cultivation. So therefore, ashram means place of developing your Krishna conscious. That's the actual definition of the word ashram. It means here's where you practice your Krishna conscious. So there's four ashrams, actually three. We don't really put much emphasis, time and energy on Vanaprastha ashram, although and there is an effort now in ISKCON to develop that ashram more. It's important also. Uh, but these are the three ashrams, Brahmachari, Grihastha, and 90%, I might, might say 85 to 90% of our devotees within the ISKCON society are in the Grihastha ashram. And so, and so again, uh, become Krishna conscious wherever you are. It's, it's not about enjoying, well, I can't enjoy as a Brahmachari, therefore I'll enjoy as a Grihastha. No. <laughs> That's not the idea. The enjoyment is uh, Krishna consciousness. That's the enjoyment. So wherever you are, practice Krishna consciousness accordingly to the rules and regulations that are at that ashram, and then you'll actually be get you get the benefit of that ashram. Yeah. These rules and regulations are fundamental for our development according to the ashram. And if you choose to move on from Brahmachari to uh, Grihastha Ashram, generally you get the blessings and permission of the senior devotees. 
But sometimes the, good, the spiritual master will tell his disciple, you should get married. Or the disciple will tell the spiritual master, I want to get married. It goes both ways. So that's one instruction you can disobey. If the, if, the, if, the, if the spiritual master tells the brahmachari, get married, he can say no. But then he has to become Krishna conscious. <laughs> Usually the spiritual master would do that just to force him to become more serious where he is. That's why he does, does that. Like that. Or if, if a... Uh, well, the other way is different. If one wants to get married and the spiritual master says, well, I don't think it's good for you, then he has to consider. But anyway, he can also disobey that instruction. But in any case, whatever ashram is, become Krishna conscious. That's what it means. And that's the reason for changing, to facilitate our Krishna consciousness. That's what it really means. Okay, any questions, comments, corrections, criticisms? You want to erase the tape? Okay, any? <laughs> yes, Adi. I <laughs> and some of them are quite scary, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, so many questions can be asked. For example, did you have some cooking shortcuts? In, uh, in your kitchen services or some shortcuts well tricks. we had we had wood stoves so we couldn't we had to go according to how much wood we had <laughs> sometimes there wasn't enough wood so things were slow and when we had more wood and it was dry things were moved faster cooking shortcuts no not really I don't think we ever considered such things. <laughs> well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. You mean to get things like, done faster? Yeah. Or some tricks, something that you just mix in. Well, in cooking, you only have, you only have so much leadway on how much you can go one way or the other. But it usually depends on, you know, on the wood we had and the facilities we were working with. And <clears throat> uh, regarding this um, verse today, uh, it sometimes seem may seem uh, not quite clear. Why didn't the father just order the other sons, uh, come on, just give give him his share, and he and he seems to uh, accept that uh, decision they, they had made and that doesn't seem to order them differently. Yeah, it doesn't, all you can do is philosophically speculate on that one. I don't think you can come to any uh, ultimate conclusion because it doesn't, there's no indication. But the father was quite intelligent, so in order to benefit, benefit his son, Nabaga, he said, you can, if you go to this sacrifice, and when the sacrifice is completed, they will leave and go to the heavenly planets, and then you will get the benefit from the, the uh, results of the sacrifice. So I guess the father had some foresight. It wasn't, didn't seem like he was an ordinary person. He was a king. Yeah, and and uh, one more question, which probably is, I mean, it. it, it mm, I hope you have uh, some something based on your experience and um, regarding austerity, sleeping very little, or doing a lot of uh, mm, services. Uh, what about some um, blowback from? Uh, austerity that is not appropriate for, for this particular person. Like, we, we seem to read that for Shudras in Dwapara Yuga, austerity was not recommended, 
and uh, we may <coughs> I have seen this both in myself and in others like after Chaturmasya or some uh, strong um, period of austerity then it, it or like even after fasting then you eat a mountain uh, like Gordon Puja yeah and then it sort of blows back further further back than yeah. than you than you did uh, yeah, austerity for Bogatiaga we call it Bhogatyaga, yes. Yeah. So, uh, do you have some? I have an example comment? for that, and we had one devotee who did Chaturmasya according to how it's supposed to be done. That means you don't shave, you don't cut your nails, you eat once a day, and they prepare kitri with no spices and no salt, and uh, you put your hands behind your back like this, and the kitchen plate is on, on the, in front of you on the floor, and you bend down, and just with your mouth you eat. You can't touch it with the food. And when you get up, that's all you get that day. That's chaturmas. <laughs> you like that, huh? <laughs> so we had one devotee who did that. <clears throat> he, he made it through the whole four months he did that. And right after that, he got married. <laughs> and then when he, he had his first child, <laughs> he asked the temple president, or the, the temple command, no, you know, the, the leader of the community to, to n name the child. So he gave him the name Kitri. So the boy was named Kitri. <laughs> He still has that name. He's a lawyer nowadays. You know, so he, he's grown up. I remember him. Nice boy. <laughs> so yeah, all his austerity, because you know, to perform Chaturmasya, the benefit is you go to the heavenly planets. That's all. But Prabhupada gave us the simplified formula for Chaturmasya. The first month, no spinach. Second month, no yogurt. Third month, no milk. Fourth month, no ordal. And that's all we did. Now it's a little bit more complicated as far as the, the foodstuffs, how it's done. And some temples don't follow it. But Prabhupada writes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, maybe you're aware of it, that we should follow these this austerity these four months. So at the end, I think in the beginning of July, Guru Purnima is the first day for. Now they've changed no spinach to no green leafy vegetables. But when Prabhupada was here, it was just spinach. And then yogurt, and milk, and urda is still there. Yeah. The Prabhupada wanted us to follow that. So he wrote about it and included it in one purport and one verse in the CC, like that. But that's all. That's the, and Prabhupada actually says that Chaturbhasya, of course to India, is that the preachers, they travel all year. And then for the four months of the rainy season when it's very difficult for travel, they stay in one place and they do their bhajan and they usually preach or just uh, study for four months. And then once the four months is over, then uh, they continue with preaching. They go out traveling again. And then during that four months, they follow that austerity that I mentioned, just eating kitri like that. And that's how it's done traditionally in India. Now, Prabhupada also gives, he says, those of you who are preachers and you're traveling, after some time after you establish your preaching to a certain level, then you can stay in one place and, and just you know, stay for the four months of the rainy season or Chaturmas and stay in one place. There's no need to travel for, throughout the year. Because sannyasis are meant to travel throughout the the whole year. That's that's the thing. They're not supposed to get comfortable any any particular place. <laughs> and 
Because if a sannyasi stays too long, then generally he gets comfortable. And getting comfortable means not good. <laughs> Have to keep moving. So, yeah. That's what it means to practice, yeah. So, but he promised that once something is established, then you can stay in one place for some time. So there are devotees who have established something and then they can, you know, work from that perspective. But still they have to preach because that's the, that's the service of a, you know, the sannyas order is to, is to preach. And of course that preaching extends in different avenues of preaching, but that's just preaching. Okay, anything else on Brahmachari? I'll say all the Brahmacharis are completely quiet. Oh, we got a brave one, okay. Okay. Kunda Madhava Yadava Hari. That's your sannyas name, we'll give you. Makunda Madhava Yadava Hari. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj. <laughs> I think we'll have to wait a bit to add <laughs> Uh, so the question is about the uh, association between brahmacharis and grihastas. What some? Oh. Well, mm, devotees should always be friendly to each other, but within that friendliness is marginalized by proper etiquette and behavior, or done in that in that context. Um, but with uh, brahmacharis and ladies, of course, then one should very carefully re, uh, avoid that association. Sometimes it's not possible. When it's not possible, we say just keep it on the point of service and then move on. That's all. Just talk about service or get the work done like that. Is that you referring to ladies or to Grihasta men? Um, to ladies, but also uh, there's different moods. Uh, Brahmacharis have some mood and uh, then the Grihastas have different mood. Yeah, not always, but generally it's correct, yeah. If you really, the whole principle is develop a strong Brahmachari ashram. That means strong for relationships between you good friendship, work together, support each other, and uh, learn the scriptures. Have brahmachari class every day where the brahmacharis get together and discuss scripture. That's important. Uh, so all of these things are... And then, I don't think it's any deviation from the ashram to speak to grihastas, but then you might want to avoid certain grihastas who are not so serious. You can, you can associate with those grihastas that are fixed nicely in their griha. Mm -hmm. like, like we got our, you know, we have our uh, Adi Purush there. So I'll always see him now as a Grihasta Brahmachari. <laughs> he's a green, moving towards Grihasta, but at the same time he still has a very good mood as a Brahmachari. Because he's been really took Brahmachari training seriously. And that's what it takes to become a, a good Grihasta. Because sometimes Brahmachari thinks, well, uh, too much austerity in this ashram. Wait till I get into Grihastha ashram, then I can, then I can really enjoy. <laughs> Forget that. <laughs> it's not about enjoyment. It's about developing Krishna consciousness with two people working together according to the principles that govern that ashram. That's all. Keeping Krishna in the center. That's the main. Point. Yeah. So yeah, there's nothing 
restrictive about associating with those in the Grihastha ashram, but you should also choose that association carefully. Okay. This is a real interesting topic. There should be hundreds of questions. Come on. Where's all the questions? Yes, okay. If I was giving this class in the West, they would be probably growling at me, throwing things at me, and asking questions one after another. <laughs> Come on, think of some questions. This is a very important topic, extremely important. Yes. Uh, Hare Krishna. Because Prabhupada said, if you don't reveal your mind and you are harboring sense gratification in the mind, then and that, that's, that's called a pretender and actually will lead to a fall down also. One of the reasons why we have ashram is to so we can reveal our minds to the other devotees in the same ashram and get guidance, get suggestions, get encouragement, get corrections. It's important, yes. Uh, you said that many devotees um, left uh, East Gone because of um, economic reasons. They couldn't maintain, or they felt they couldn't maintain their life as a Grihastha and at the same time practice Krishna consciousness. The society wasn't developed enough in order to facilitate that. So it was, it was partly due to the society wasn't what they wasn't able to facilitate Grihastas. So now what we need is to develop communities. Grihastas do really good when they work together as Grihastas in a communal type living style. You can create community even in a in a uh, urban environment also. Like I know one temple all of the all of the Grihastas live on the same street. They have bought all of the buildings on the same. Not just one temple. It's there in Dallas, Texas. It's there in Los Angeles, California. The whole street is is only devotees, and they live in their different houses, like that. I was thinking about uh, jobs inside the community uh, for devotees who are not in brahmacharis that that devotees can work together also for, you know, what I mean? Yeah, supporting their economic needs, yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, sometimes devotees start businesses together. And if you, I mean, there's devotees who have started like prashadam businesses. And they get together and they make a little bit of a, you know, they, they start making different kinds of sweets or cookies or cakes and stuff and then they turn it into a business. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Or even making other little items. You can make, you could probably make, you know, deities also. And so many things you can do within the society that complements our particular lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's being done in many places. Mm -hmm. But not enough, that's the problem. Okay, anything else? Yes. You're not going to get a class like this every day, so here's your chance. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Just a quick, simple question, because I understood from this lecture at one point that a real Brahmachari needs to really understand the scripture and uh, yeah, you know, he should at least study it. But what happens if that particular person, that particular devotee really struggles to understand and to you know, he struggles for years maybe and cannot memorize, cannot, you know. Well, that means he's, he can do other services, of course. Mm -hmm. But for brahmachari, it's bro. The word brahmachari means student. That's the actual translation. It means student. So student means to study, and study what? 
the books. <laughs> so maybe it wouldn't be the main thing, but it should be done to some degree. And therefore we should have classes in order to instruct and teach brahmacharis in different areas. So part of that uh, student means to come to the classes. Morning class, evening class. Here it's nice because you have both morning and evening class. Some temples have actually don't even have an evening class anymore. It's sad, but it's for whatever way or reason, I don't know. But yeah, you have two classes a day. So the brahmachari should attend both of those classes, unless they have some unavoidable service at that time. And then what we've done, we put speakers connecting the class to different places throughout the ashram and the temple. So wherever you are, you can also hear the class while you're doing your seva. Yeah. Can I ask you about the evening class? Because <clears throat> it seems that some devotees uh, living or working further away from the temple complain that it takes two hours or one and a half hour to drive to the temple. So <clears throat> they find it difficult to attend. You mean that would be a grihasta, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not that grihastas are required to go every day to the temple, but they should do something in their home then. It's not they should neglect, you know. Like, I, I don't always come to Mangalarti, but I hear Mangalarti every day from Prabhupada. I don't miss Mangalarti. I just hear Prabhupada chanting the Mangalarti prayers every day. Yeah. I listen to Prabhupada's class every day, both in the morning. So I stay connected to some, at least these two part, important parts of the program. When you're at home, if you have deities, then you can also do a, you know, a simple morning program. And when children come, it's nice because they also learn right at home with their parents. What is Krishna consciousness? They can also take part. Yeah. So the home can be a mandir also. All right, so previously we didn't have much of this problem because everybody was in the temple. So that's, they, there was no transportation issue. Initially, yeah, it was like that. Yeah, and for years it was like that, for a long time, even after Prabhupada left. There was no congregation. Congregation came later. It started mostly with the Indian congregation because then we started to uh, reach out to them, and then, then they became our congregation. And then, as it, mostly when our Western devotees left the temple, they just kind of drifted away. They didn't, and if they came, they came for festivals, or they came for Sunday feast, and practically all. Once in a while they would come for some service, but not as a regular basis. I encourage the devotees in the temples to reach out to the congregation to bring the congregation in so they can also take part in the services and also support the temple by doing that. These are practical things. Okay, so I don't think I should take up much more time. So all, all of you other ten people that have questions, just hold your questions for next time. <laughs> and we'll have to move on to uh, the other part of life. It's called prashadam. I know it's an austerity, but we have to do it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Shrimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Yeah.